people are joining us. Welcome everyone. We're just going to give it like one minute before we start to make sure people can get on. I could, the numbers are climbing really fast. Pam and I are already here and I'm very excited. And we have our cocktails for historical happy hour. We do. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We will wait till 701 and then I will dive in. Your people are way more prompt than my students. I'll tell you when I teach on Zoom, it's like, oh, you teach on Zoom. <laughs> I do teach on Zoom. Oh, I see Andrea Katz. Hi. Oh, there. Okay. I'm going to put this up the side. And Mandy and Pi Pi. Yay. Thanks for coming. All right. We're up to 84. So I think I'm going to jump in. So Welcome everyone to my third historical happy hour. I'm so, so excited to have Pam Jan up here. I've been a longtime fan and I feel like Pam, we, I feel like we've known each other over social media and we have a lot of mutual friends. So it's just so nice to get to know you even though it's virtual. Um, so thank you for being on tonight. I'm so thrilled. I'm thrilled. You're like the oldest friend I've never met, right? Oh, know, exactly. We're gonna have to fix that after this pandemic. Absolutely. We're going on the road. New York City somewhere, I know. Yes. Um, so I'm gonna do a quick intro. I think you have a lot of fans on here, obviously, but um, we're here to talk about Pam's new book, The Woman with the Blue Star, which is beautiful and amazing. And I'm so excited. And this is, I have a lot of book club, you know, people who sign up for these webinars. This is a great book club book. It's just a perfect pick. So, um, so intro about Pam, very brief, I could go on and on. Pam is the author of The Commandant's Girl, which was an international bestseller and nominated for a Quill Award, as well as The Winter Guest the, and The Diplomat's Wife, The Ambassador's Daughter, Almost Home, A Hidden Affair, and The Things We Cherish. She also authored a short story in the anthology Grand Central, original post-war stories of love and reunion. She lives outside of Philadelphia with her husband and three children, and The Woman with the Blue Star, which comes out May 5th, is this your 11th? You are good. Very few yes. people get that right. That is number 11. Yes. Amazing. Amazing. So great. Thank you. Um, so I want to just jump in. So if you can tell us about the inspiration, the history that inspired this amazing story. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Jane, for having me here. You have such a look at this great group of enthusiastic folks, and I'm really, uh, really super grateful to be here. So um, I never assume anyone's ever heard of me. Um, so I'm going to start at the beginning, which is to say, before this book, um, how I came to write books that are primarily centered around World War II. So try and keep this brief, I was um, sent to Poland as a diplomat for the US government around 1996. Um, and it was at a time when that part of the world had come out of communism. Um, and they were um, grappling with a lot of issues from World War II, which they'd never been able to resolve when they had no free speech for half a century. And so I got to Poland um, and I'm Jewish and I became very close to the survivors. And so the US government put me in charge of that work. Um, so I worked on Holocaust issues for two and a half years while I was living in Poland. And as you can imagine, that was an experience that changed me really, you know, personally, professionally. And I came back from there knowing I wanted to write about it. And I've been doing so largely ever since. Um, so that's how I come to the war. And I'm happy to talk about that more if people have questions later. Um, specifically, the woman with the blue star did not come from my own experiences, but from a story I found. Um, and this is one of the first times I'm talking about the woman with the blue star. So you'll have to bear with me. But Jane, I don't know about you, but I go looking for my ideas, right? And I'm looking for the idea that makes me go, oh, you know, because if, if I gasp, yeah. then I'm hopeful my readers will. And yeah. I discovered while researching an incredible story of a group of Jewish people in Lviv, or some say Lviv, Poland. Um, it, it, right now it's in Ukraine, but at the time it was in Poland. Um, and these people had to escape the Nazis and survive in the sewer. And not just escape through the sewer, like run through the sewer, as we've heard in other stories, but they actually had to live in the sewer and some of them for as long as 14 months. And so I had never 
heard this story before, but I certainly gasped. And yeah. it was that aha moment that led me fictitiously, because I write fiction, um, to creating The Woman with the Blue Star. Oh, it just it's just an incredible story and shocking that so much of it is based in fact. That was the thing that just is mind blowing. And so what one of the things I, I we talked about at my launch, Pam was so generous and nice to attend my launch event. And we talked about how sometimes settings um, almost feel like another character in the book. And I felt, I, you know, I, I, it's, I'm glad you shared the background about living in Krakow and the work that you did there, because I was going to mention it in this question. Um, I love that this book had such a strong sense of place in Krakow, Poland, and how it almost felt like another character. Like I, I could see it, I could feel it and smell it. And, and I know that you, it wasn't, the story wasn't, the real story did not take place in Krakow. And, and tell me why you made the decision to move it there. Uh, there are a few reasons. Um, you know, first of all, I don't like to write, I don't write the stories of real people. For me, yeah. they, those stories are not mine to tell by and large. And so I always like to get a little bit of distance from it. Mm -hmm. um, Krakow is a city that is very, very near to my heart from the time when I lived there um, and a place that I just can really feel. And especially when COVID happened, it became very clear we weren't going anywhere for research. Um, <laughs> right. So I, I picked Krakow. Um, and, uh, you know, additionally, it's a city, I think, for readers on some level, that's a little bit more accessible, accessible mm -hmm. perhaps than Lviv would yes. have been. So a number of factors went into it. Okay. Yeah. And you could feel like your love of the city come through in the writing. I really felt that. Thank you. Um, one of the, uh, you know, the relationship between them, there's two main characters, Sadie and Ella. And actually, before I, I ask the question, why don't you tell me a little bit about the two main characters in this, in the novel? Okay, absolutely. So Sadie is a young Jewish woman who is living with her family. Um, they were forced to move to the ghetto. So they're living in already horrific circumstances. And, you know, uh, when the danger is just worsening and when there's an action to finally liquidate the ghetto, Sadie escapes with her father and her pregnant mother into the sewer. So she is living there. Um, things get much worse very, very quickly for her because as you can imagine, there's so many dangers to the sewer. It's the risk of detection. It's the risk of drowning. It's the risk of starvation and, and, and many, many other things. And so she is living in the sewer with her mother. And one day she looks up through a grate, through a sewer grate, just like you can imagine. And this is inspired by a bit of true history that there was a young girl in the sewer who looked up and she saw a girl her own age on the street buying flowers. And if you can imagine that disparity between yourself living in such deprivation for months and you see someone just like you on the street buying flowers, um, and Sadie was struck by that moment, as was the person in real life. Um, and her mother told her, someday there will be flowers for you oh. as well. And so my book looks at this friendship between Sadie, who's the girl in the sewer, and Ella. Ella is a Polish girl. She's not Jewish. Um, and she lives with relative ease and, and some affluence um, in, uh, in Krakow. But she's got her own problems. She's got you know, a fiance who she thought was off at the war, who maybe just isn't her fiance anymore. Um, most of her family is gone and she lives with a stepmother who collaborates with the Nazis. And so um, she's got her own difficult circumstance. And the last thing she needs is to spot this set of eyes looking up at her from the sewer and realize that she absolutely must help. Yeah, yeah. And that that friendship felt really authentic and organic to me, even though they came from such different backgrounds. And the thing that became clear is, I mean, Sadie obviously needed Ella and her friendship to survive, but Ella needed Sadie's friendship just as much in some ways, if, and in some ways, even more, you know, she needed to have purpose and needed to, you know, get involved in some way. Yeah, I do. I do often find that turn of fate. First of all, the war brings together such unlikely people to begin with, people who through other circumstances never would have met. And then, um, you know, to watch the dynamic change as, as they need each other um, at different points in different ways is very powerful for me. And I think very re reflective of what we experience in our own lives. 
Yes. Yeah. It was, it was so beautiful. I loved it. And um, did you know from the start of the novel it, that you would be telling it from their two different perspectives instead of just from say Sadie's perspective? Cause she was the one who was in the sewer. I mean, was that a choice from the very beginning? May I be really honest here? Yeah. <laughs> I always, oh, yeah. I always, no, I always tell it like it is, although sometimes you may get more than you bargained for. So anyone who is struggling with a novel or thinking about writing a novel, I want you to take this story to heart. I turned in this book, my 11th book, and my editor looked at it and went, no. And that was actually the first time that's happened to me where I had to go back and rewrite 95% of a book. And so it was a very, um, it was a very humbling, a very learning and a very useful experience once I got through it. Um, but I say that because my first draft was only Sadie's perspective. And so oh, okay. it was my editor who said, let's talk about Sadie and Ella. And I wasn't sure if I would find that depth in Ella, but I'm honestly much happier for the result. Yeah, no, it's so well done. And I, I read that note in the back about how you had to like basically do a reboot. And I was so shocked and like oh gosh I mean you know as a writer I felt it so strongly like I'm you know I empathize so much but but the end result is is beautiful so here's here's even more of an image for you the meeting where I had that I had with my editor the phone call where I learned this, this is pre-covid I was pulling over between stops and I had to take the meeting in a Bob Evans like a diner. <laughs> and so I had this awful meeting by myself in a Bob Evans and I you know I sort of um I, and I never go to Bob Evans. It's the only time I've been there in my entire life. And then, um, but it was a horrible moment. And then there's this quote from the Godfather. I'm going to mess it up terribly, but it's something like, this is the business we've chosen. And so, you know, just kind of like, all right, let's do Hold this. On. Yeah, yeah, I, I loved that. I, I read that in the back and I'm like, yeah, that's, that's actually, this is what we signed up for. That's exactly. Right. This is what we do. It was great, actually. It was a really good experience. Oh, good, good, good. Um, oh, so another question about, uh, about characters, because I saw your post the other day about um, the, the real person who uh, the character, Paul, is it Powell, Powell, pronounced Pavel, Pavel, Pavel. Pavel. Yeah. Um, is a, it, Pavel is the sanitation worker who essentially helps the Jewish families escape and, and survive in the sewers. And that was based on a real, a real man who was very like, unique character but compassionate and brave and so tell me a little bit about the real the sure. real Pavel. and yeah. my, per my person is highly fictionalized but the real person was a gentleman named leopold stotch he was an unlikely hero he was yeah. by all accounts a former burglar who was now a sanitation worker um who saw the plight of jews and i think even before they went into the sewer he had been helping and planning and all of that and then um when it happened, you know, he hid these people. Um, originally, they gave him money for groceries and stuff, just such. But yeah. at some point, they're in the sewer and they ran out of money and right. they didn't know what was going to happen. And he kept coming and he kept bringing them food, obviously at great peril to his own family. And he would have to go all over the city to find food without arousing suspicion. Like, how was he feeding all of these people? He had a system where, um, if you know the Germans were in the sewer, he would swing his lantern a certain way, kind of to send a signal. Um, wow. So he was, I mean, he had a few, you know, his wife and, and a few workers help him, but he in real life was the person. And so in my book, I have fictionalized a person like this in my character, Pavel. Again, not all parallels, um, yeah. you know, because in um in real life uh leopold uh died in a bike accident saving his oh, daughter from an oncoming lorry right after the war um yeah. so not writing the real person in any respect but just inspired by this story of courage yeah yeah and i just um i just love stories like that from history where people rise to the occasion you know that you wouldn't ex you know he's kind of an unexpected you wouldn't really expect it of like the, the real guy because he was a thief and a burglar and you know and, and he rose to the occasion and became this hero and I love stories like that and that you use that in, in this book. Um, so in your acknowledgments you write about having to do the rewrite with three kids and also teaching at Rutgers right <laughs> so that was crazy um, but one of the things I loved that you wrote, I found in the process of writing this book, the themes emerged of coping with isolation and an uncertain future 
which were more relevant to our current world situa situation than I ever could have imagined. And I, you know, one thing I've been talking about to a lot of historical fiction writers, like, do you think people are turning to historical fiction right now because it's comforting to read about other times in history where the world situation was, was dark and confusing and people still found ways to persevere and find hope? So let me situate this when I was doing this revision in time. I got that Bob Evans meeting, the Bob Evans call was in December of 2019, right? So we start 2020, I'm doing these heavy revisions, but I'm okay, January, February. And one of the things I made it Sadie and Ella, and I moved the story from Lavoop, that's when it moved it to Krakow. And I said, okay, like the, the cherry on the top of this is, for me is going to be going to Krakow because I haven't been to Krakow in 17 years and I want to go back and see people and walk the streets and feel it. So I booked myself a nice plane ticket, just mom, no kids. And I booked that plane ticket for March 11th of 2020. And that night the world shut down. The world yeah. shut down. I didn't get to go. And thank God I didn't because I had an emergency appendectomy the next day. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but I never got to go to Poland. But then I found myself doing these revisions in the middle of the pandemic. And there's these themes in the book, right? Of these, this very extreme isolation in the sewer um, yeah. and also the connection that Sadie makes with Ella on the street. And by no means am I suggesting that what we've gone through anywhere approaches what they went through during the Holocaust, I'm not. But these themes were very resonant. Think about it, last spring, we had to start thinking about things that we never thought as as moms and as women that we oh, would yeah. ever think about like how am I going to or like are we going to be able to get food or toilet paper and yes. how are we going to educate our children and questions of kind of and you know base level survival that we've never thought about and during the war that happened to people as well you know people yeah. went from their everyday lives to just trying to stay alive yeah yeah absolutely I know yeah the parallels are Unbelievable. And that's unbelievable that you booked it for March 11th. We just had come home from a trip on like March 7th and then yeah. it was like, that's it for a while. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was like, I'm going, I'm going. And then, you know, I'll wear my mask. I'm going. <laughs> right. Yeah. Oh, so hopefully soon. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about um, the writing process because I find readers really, you know, viewers really enjoy listening to some of these answers. So what is your favorite part of the writing process? And what is the part that you absolutely dread? My favorite part is the early days. So let me say, you know, that whole distinction where there's plotters who outline and there's pantsers who just kind of write by the seat of their pants. I am definitely a pantser. Um, oh, okay. now, now, after the debacle of the last book, I do sketch an outline for my editor. But in general, I'm someone who just throws the words on the page. Like they call it vomiting on the page, which you like, <laughs> yeah. right? Um, that's the best part of the process because, you know, it's stream of conscious. It's early, it's early days. It's like, it's like the early days of dating, right? Super <laughs> casual, yeah, right? Yeah. Like whatever. You can do that kind of writing anywhere. Like you could yeah. do that writing on your laptop in Starbucks back in the day or Panera, back you know? I know. Right? <laughs> Panera. I miss yeah. the Panera office. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. that's by far my favorite favorite part of the process. Um, but I'll tell you the flip side, my least favorite part of the process comes immediately after my favorite part. If you're going to throw down 60,000 words in random order, it takes a really long time to put them in the right place and make them look nice. And clean them up. Yeah. Yeah. Up. I, get That's it. A, I don't yeah. recommend it. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I find that so interesting because everyone's process is so different. And I, I, I've talked to Hank Phillippe Ryan is a friend and she, her process is very similar to yours. And I am like, total plotter like scene by scene chapter by chapter but I do that is kind of like my first rough draft like I put random notes and dialogue and pictures and all that kind of so it's like a big hot mess when I start writing the actual draft so someone yeah. said that plotting is like scaffolding yes. and um pantsing is like an archaeological dig so you like pick yes. up this thing and you brush it off and you're not quite sure what it is I love that yeah yeah, yeah. That's a good comparison. Um, so do you ever, so you've been writing historical fiction for years now, and have you ever thought about writing kind of outside the genre? And if yes, what genre would you love to write in? 
So let me say this. I, um, I, of my 11 books, two were modern, almost home oh, okay. and a hidden affair were modern. The things we cherished was one of those modern historical hybrid books. Um, and I've also done some other things. Like I wrote, um, the ambassador's daughter is set after world war one, the last summer at Chelsea beach is set on the home front during the second world war. So I've done a bunch of different things and I'm watching Mindy Ehrlich who's like the most amazing cheerleader in the chat thank you for your yes. concerts I love you <laughs> um but uh, so uh, if I was going to do anything there are a couple of modern ideas that I would love I'm not going to say them here in case I ever get to do them right, um, right. but it, you know um that I'd like like to grab if I wasn't still you know I teach law school as well if I wasn't doing that I'd love to grab a pseudonym and write like a big juicy modern day maybe romance or something like that i would i would do that but there's so much to do with the war and yes. uh, my my plate and my heart are full right now <laughs> so who says jenny ellis says i would read your grocery list pam <laughs> oh i love jenny jenny's so, one of my right. very favorite librarians in the world oh, that's awesome <laughs> um so uh, question this is a question I get asked a lot so I'm really curious like do you have when you finish a project when you're done you know the woman with the blue star is done it's coming out do you have trouble letting go of the characters after you're finished with the book no so oh, are we still here I think I'm coming back wait a minute all right there all we right. go I see you <laughs> hi so no so let me say I th I have heard I don't know if this is true I don't know like I imagine my kids are 11 or 10, 10 and 12, right? So I don't know if this is true, but I feel like it's like when you have that kid that's like about to go off to college and like you're sad, but you're also like, like, you know, I don't, maybe you're like, go. Oh, no, that, that's where I'm at. That, yeah. Right? I don't know. I don't know if that's true. I'll ask me in a few years, but it's just that point where like, by that point, I've had it. Like, I don't want to read that thing one more time, you know, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I've had it. So, I mean, there are a few times, like when I finished Commandant's Girl and I unexpectedly wrote a sequel. So there are a few times oh, yeah. it comes back around, but I'm not, you know, there's always some new project that you want to work on. Yeah. And I think I, I'm the same way as you are like, when I'm done, I am done. And, right. and the shiny new object in the corner is like, you know, I'm like ready to like look at that. So I know you can't look at it till you're done for no, sure. Yeah, yeah, you definitely can. Um, so, oh, last question, and then I'm going to take some questions from readers. So, if you want to put um, questions in the Q and A or questions in the chat, I will look them up and ask Pam. But um, you're doing this hundred days of books, and so I want to ask, like, what are you reading now? And tell us about the hundred days of books too. Okay, so this is the third time I've done the 100 days of books. 100 days of books is where every day for 100 days, I think today was day 95 this time, I post a book that I have loved. Um, some of them I've read, but they're not out yet. So they could be older books. They can be debuts. They can be bestsellers. Um, I post 100 books, one a day, and I post it across Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, I have a Pinterest board and I'll try and pop up a Goodreads re review, you know, and do all of that. And it's a way of authentically having a conversation about books that I have loved. Um, so um, you're more, anyone's more than welcome to join me. I'm work, just wrapping up the hundred days right now. And it's been a great experience. So what have I read recently? Um, I, I read uh, Half-Life by Jillian Cantor, oh, Band of Sisters. But I read across genres. I'm really excited about Mary Kubica's new book, which comes oh, out in yeah. May. Um, yeah. a Woman Gone Missing. I don't want to get the title wrong. Um, I thought Francesca Saratella's Ghosts of Harvard was an amazing book this past year. Um, I am about to start uh, a galley from Alka Joshi and a galley from Erica Roebuck, and I'm very excited about those. Oh, awesome. And you're so nice and generous to share these books and support other authors. It's so great. And I'm going to share what I'm reading because I'm going to Tell me. interview you her. Have me. This is Liza Nash Taylor. Um, I, I met her at the Historical Novel Society Conference and it's her second novel and it's in all good faith and it comes out in August and she's going to be on in August and it's um it's beautiful book. So I'm it looks excited amazing. about I'm that. Find yes. it. Thank you. So um, I, all right, so Nancy Smith emailed me today with a question, um, and then I'm going to take questions from the chat. We've got some and from Q&A. So 
Nancy asks, what, which one of your books was your favorite to write and why? That is like picking between your children. That's Although I don't have 11 say. children. Um, <laughs> so let me say, oh, obviously Blue Star is my new baby. Commandant's yeah. Girl was my firstborn. Um, the Orphan's <laughs> Tale was number nine, but was the first one to hit the New York Times. So I have special place in my heart for that one. But I'm going to tell you a secret. Some of the ones I like have the most affection for are the stinkers that didn't do that well. I'm going to be honest. So I have a couple of those. So Almost Home was this book I wrote. It was one of the modern books about a woman who, who's a diplomat who returns to Cambridge to find out the truth about what really happened to her deceased boyfriend. Um, so that was a mystery. My other sentimental favorite is actually The Last Summer at Chelsea Beach. And that's the oh, yeah. one on the home front during World War II. It's Philadelphia and Atlantic City, um, which was very much a personal journey for me. So I love that one. Oh, nice, nice. Yes. Excellent. Um, okay. I teach right. law school. There's no short answers. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. This is so great. Um, so Afton and Damon, Damon asks, where can we purchase autographed copies of your books right now? Oh, that's a wonderful question. So, you know, sadly, I used to get to go everywhere, but sadly the pandemic, I'm not, I, everything will be virtual for my tour. I'll have it. I have a launch on May 5th, which will be great, but um, everything will be virtual on my tour. So if you want um, personalized autograph books, here's what we do. Inkwood Books, which is in Haddonfield, New Jersey, and if you can't find it, just write to me, is my local indie. Literally, I before the pandemic, I would like go to Wegmans and then sign books on the way home. So <laughs> they are taking orders for, they'll write out the inscription, however you want it sent. And then I'll go to the store and sign it and they will mail it to you. So that's Inkwood Books in Haddonfield, New Jersey. Awesome. Awesome. Um, Susan Seligman asks, do you ever think of an idea for your next book while you're working on your current story? So first you, I want to, Susan, she's a huge fan. I was just going to say that. Hi, yeah. so I see you everywhere and I love it. You're, you're like so the best. You always, you always say nice things on the hundred days and I'm so yeah. grateful to you. Thank so you for awesome. all you do. Um, so I do always have like that bright, shiny object in the corner, right. That I'm thinking about for the next yeah. book. Um, I, I, but I definitely don't work on it. And I will tell you honestly, sometimes in publishing, I could be super excited about something and it might not like thrill my publisher. So um, yeah. I float ideas and then we figure out what is right kind of before I start. But I always finish the book I'm writing first. You know, you can't play with your new toys till you've cleaned up your old toys. <laughs> That's right. That's right. right. That's so um, I, I, I have an idea, but I don't actually, and it's hard for me to even start a new book when I'm still revising. I don't know about you, Jane. When I'm still yeah. revising, it's oh, yeah. hard to yeah. do, but yeah. I don't take time off. The minute that book is done, I'm on the next one. Awesome. Impressive. You. Um, you, you made a good point. And I, I, there's more questions here, but one I meant to add to my list, uh, uh, people asked about like, you know, writers who are trying to get published or trying to write their first novel, ask for writing mm -hmm. advice. And you gave some great advice during the launch. And can you, can you share that again? And also yeah. you but part of it, you talked about protecting your writing time. And I really want to know how you do that with, uh, you know, three Ooh. kids and a, and a job teaching. <laughs> so. so let me say this. Um, I love, I'm so glad you asked that because I actually feel really strongly about the writing advice piece. So I would love to share it. And there were three yeah. points. And the first, as you said, Jane, is you have to protect your writing time. And what I mean by that is nobody, not my sainted mom or my beloved husband or anyone who's the, my most supportive people ever say like, oh, go take some writing time. Nobody says that for us, right? We've got lots going on. And so you have to kind of block that time. Um, for me, I'm an early morning person. I want 5 a.m. for my writing. And sometimes lately I've been saying to the kids, like, mom's gone to bed, you know? Yeah. Um, but I think, so you have to kind of like be disciplined but I think you have to be flexible with that time, right? You can't yeah. say, I only write at this time and this place, because sometimes you don't get it. You have to move yeah. and you have to do things at a different time. The second piece of writing advice is if you want to do this, be really tenacious. Um, don't give up because it took five years and 39 rejections before my first book was accepted. And if, yeah. right, how about yeah. you, Jane? A oh, bunch? Be, um, yeah, I, I stopped counting at, at 50, you know, <laughs> yeah. the, and that was for the Saturday Evening Girls Club, but then I like put it on a shelf and sh 
try it again a couple of years yeah. later. So yeah. just keep knocking. It's really, really true. The only thing I, I was in a writer's workshop and the only reason I'm published versus other people is I was definitely, there were many more people talented than me. I was the only one who I think kept knocking. Yeah. Um, yeah. And the last would be, you must have that ability to revise your work right? To take that's, that's someone else's one. feedback because they don't give us solutions. They give us problems. That's right. That's absolutely. Yeah. And, and also, you know, have a, have a thicker skin for that. Like they're trying to make it the best book that can be. So I think right. like having a, a big, a thicker skin is, is good. Okay. So, so there's some other awesome questions here. Yes. Can you explain the significance of the blue star? I meant to ask you that too. That's a good question. Of course. So interestingly, we always think about that Jewish people during the Holocaust were forced to wear a yellow star. And in many countries, that was true. But in the particular part of Poland where I'm writing, it was a white band with a blue star. Yeah. So that's the star. And of course, once she's in the sewer, she doesn't have to wear that star, but it's sort of an identity piece. Right, right. Okay. Yeah, I didn't realize that about the blue star. So that was a great question. And and um, stars are kind of a theme in the book as well, not just yeah, the, that's not right. Um, and someone else said it's a, the cover is gorgeous. I will hold it up. You. Do you have a say in the cover? Do they give you much of a say in the cover design? Mm, the two things I have the least control over, I feel like, are covers and titles. So with covers, there's I may give some input, but there's so many people who look at a cover before I ever do people who are trained because I have no visual aesthetic in life like I can't make anything yeah, look nice. This is a fake living room behind me. Okay, so, so I, can't, I can't make anything look nice in this world. Um, so there's lots of talented people who think about it before I'm ever involved. Now, when I get involved, I get to give feedback. Um, and I get to do that, but they, they talk to like the accounts, right? The big the stores and, yes. and they get all that feedback. So there's a lot of people involved and sometimes it takes a few tries to get it right. Sometimes yeah. they hit it out of the park right away. And then with titles, you said that you, they, a lot, that's a, that's a by committee as well. I, same here, like title. I'm ter I'm not very good at titles. So <laughs> I don't think one. any, I'm not sure any title I've ever had has ever stuck. Oh, I'm really? Not, oh, I'm wow. not actually sure that any title I've had has ever stuck. It always gets changed. I give some suggestions, then I get changed. Can I tell you my favorite story about title change? And it's going to be kind of graphic. So stay with me. Okay. Um, I had written a book I called The Anniversary Clock. And I had, baby twins and forgive me I was breastfeeding twins and you know you have no free hands when you do that and my phone rang and it was the big editor I was at a different house like the bubby of all editors right and they never call you so I put right. the phone like this with the babies and I was like yes god and <laughs> he was like we're changing the title of the anniversary clock to the things we cherish click and that was it that was it <laughs> wow okay true story true story <laughs> that is great. Um, Nancy Smith also asked, email me and asked for a reader that is just getting to know your books, which one of your books do you recommend that they read first? Well, definitely the woman with the blue star since it's yes. coming out. Um, but if, if it was, if you were looking like sooner than May 4th to read a book, it depends on what you're looking for. If you're looking for something, I mean, Commandant's Girl is my first book. So a lot of people start there. If you're looking for something a little heavier, The Orphan's Tale is pretty serious. Um, and if you're looking for something more like fun, espionage, more towards Jane's The Secret Stealers, I would say The Lost Girls of Paris. Okay. Very good. All excellent. Um, oh, this is another good question. Did you add on the prologue and the epilogue later, or was that something that you planned from the start? Plans from the start. So even though I'm a pantser, I almost always have that opening scene and I always, um, I, and I always have that kind of the end. And then there's a few high moments that are like lighthouses that help you along the way. Although things can change and I don't want to say too much without giving it away. Um, but things can definitely change in the ending. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. So, and, um, I'm just trying to scroll and talk at the same time. I want to make sure I don't miss anyone. Susan has another great question for both of you ladies. Were, were you readers growing up and what books and authors inspired you when you were growing up? That's a great You question. go, go, go. Jamie. Okay. So one of them, I was a huge reader growing up. And one of the books that 
I still have my tattered copy on my shelf upstairs that like totally, I, I just fell in love with it as you can only do. I think when you're younger, sometimes when you're a kid and like you just connect with the story was a wrinkle in time by Madeline Lengel. I yes, just yes. adored that book. I adored Meg. I totally connected with her and identified with her. So that was Madeline Lengel was one of my all time favorites and still is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What about you? Well, I, I was definitely, you know, the, the intensely reading child. So I was a big, predictably Judy Bloom story fan, uh, but this comes with a good story. So my fifth grade yearbook, I still have it said the next Judy Bloom, because I even then I wanted to write. So I love Judy. And <laughs> um, when I was an aspiring writer, you know, maybe 20, 25 years ago, I actually had written her a fan email to get oh, some advice. So so big great. Judy fan. So two years ago, my family and I, we were on vacation in Key West. And I heard that Judy owns the bookstore in Key West. And we walked oh, great, over great. to the bookstore. She was standing there. And <laughs> I lost my mind, right? I just completely babbled for hours. And anyway, she invited <laughs> me back on book tour to stay at her house. So that was really oh, amazing. Um, amazing. And I, I went and I looked. The email I sent her when I was an aspiring writer was exactly 20 years to the day from the day I met her same day oh, it's yeah. faded that's it was amazing faded. so oh. judy had a big influence <laughs> so great um how's our house in key west by the way it was lovely it oh, was really, really lovely it was very <laughs> nice and very just a very special experience oh absolutely yeah i also love judy bloom and you know I, I wore i read you know a couple of them too young and like all we like we all did and <laughs> right right i know yeah, yeah. Intense. It's intense. um so, oh, other questions. Um, I just missed one. Oh, what are you working on now? Like what's your next project if you wanna share or not? Uh, so let me say this, I am normally an open book about my next project for right now, for some reason I'm feeling very squirrely. So let me say <laughs> I'm deeply into it. I am like 36,000 words of junk oh. into it. And I promise, oh, okay. I think there will be more soon, but humor me, ask me that in a couple months. So I'll, talk, <laughs> awesome. I'll, I'll tell tales. Um, what else was I got? I'm looking at other questions that are coming in and I'm just going to, it's make hard. Sure it's super are. hard to monitor the chat. Oh, yeah, I've been there. I'm getting a little better at it, but um, let's see. Oh, talk to me about your launch events while, while I'm going through here. Like what other, um, you know, what do you have coming up and how can people sign up for them? Amazing. So I just got a new website yesterday. So I'm a little behind the curve posting all of my events, but here's what I will tell you. Well, I have some nice stops in, um, in April. Like I'm going to be at great thoughts online. Awesome. We're going to do that. Um, my launch is on May 5th, which is the day after my book comes out and I'm launching with seven independent bookstores. Um, and the incredible Lisa Wingate is going to be in conversation. Right. So that is my launch. And then the second night I'm doing a launch with the Jewish community centers, because you know, they're very special to me. And yes. so with over 25 JCCs, we're going to have a virtual event um, then, and that's going to be with my dear friend, Allison Richmond in conversation. So um, there's many more events. I promise I'll get them up there in May, but the big one um, will be the launch on May 5th with the bookstores. And if anyone can sign up for that anywhere. Yeah. So what you would do, that one is up already on my website. Okay. And what you can do is you can register for that event with any of the seven stores that are participating and all of their links are on my website. So you would just go to pamgenoff.com and it's there. Okay. Awesome. Um, Marsha Dusing asks, when do you have time to read? So I don't really, but I have found little windows of time, you know, when the kids were a little younger, I would read when they were reading kind of next to each other, you know, um, that occasional moment in the bathtub, but I'll tell you where I'm reading right now is the pickup line at school. Oh, because yeah. Nice. We haven't put the kids back on the buses yet, and I'm yeah. driving to two different schools and sitting. And so I've actually been reading in the pickup line when I pick up my kids. I was also I posted a picture signing book plates for the autographs. Oh, in, I saw in that. The yeah. line. <laughs> Excellent. Um, oh, this is specific to um, one of your books. If you did have an opportunity to write a modern day novel, would you follow up with Jordan Weiss? So that was the Almost Home book, which was the Cambridge one, which did have a sequel, A Hidden Affair. 
I think I, I Jordan's one of my favorites, but I think I'm done there. Um, I, you know, I don't know. <laughs> There's a couple of really like great modern ideas that I would love to write about things that, you know, that women go through um, some, or, or some things about that involve social media. There's just things you can't do in historical, not that I'm complaining. So um, right, right. I think I would go in a to like uh, almost tone was more suspenseful. And I think I would go in more of a, a comedic or lighter sort of way if I ever did that, but I'm not funny. That's the sad truth. I'm not, a, I am not a humorous sure? person. I'm not humorous. I promise you can ask my family. I'm unfunny. Oh, uh, this is a question I, and I have more coming in from people, but I was just thinking about, um, you know, I've written only three novels and my first one I, is very close to my heart, but I think it would be a very different book if I wrote it today. And do you feel like that about some of your past novels? I, I do. Um, so let me say this. Um, there is, I think, with social media and with all of us being connected, which is amazing, by the way, that we are all connected in this really powerful way. There's a different level of accountability in historical fiction. I'm being oh. really honest here, right? Yes. So once upon a time, when I wrote my first book, I thought if I created this world, it was almost like Tolkien-esque, you know? Like if I created this world that was plausible, people should just go with it, right? Mm -hmm. And then you know, you would get these, these really like very specific comments about things that you either got wrong or people disagreed with. And so then we spent all this time arguing about, did a bus in 1946 London cost two pence or five pence and did it have doors? So we've gotten to this really granular level of detail, which yeah. I respect and I want to own tremendously yes. but it's certainly there's things you did in your earlier books that you don't get to change right right yeah that's that's absolutely right and I it's true people um the accountability is is it's amazing and then sometimes it's it's a lot <laughs> you know like it's amazing that people notice these details and like read it and are so into the history but yeah I mean it is fiction at the end of the day so let me yeah. let me be honest this new book I had a historical fiction fact checker, a language person, a cop, I mean, like four or five people to the point where they were disagreeing with each other and the mistakes will still be there and they'll be all mine. I mean, it's, yeah. it's very terrifying. And by the way, the flogging these days, it's not an email. It's very public, right? It's a very oh, public flogging. <laughs> yes, it is, Pam. Yes, it is. It is. Um, and so... I, and it, I understand that, but it's, it's scary, you know? Yeah. So it's really tough, but here's what I always remember. Did you see Game of Thrones when they left the water bottle on the set? I love that. <laughs> that makes me feel all better. Exactly. If they can do it, you know, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, where, oh, this first two questions. It, Amara asks, Amara Boris asks, any potential books turning into movies? Ooh, good question. Hi, Amara. Um, so the, uh, for years, if you had asked me that question, I would have said from your mouth to God's ears, right? Cause it was never <laughs> happening. Um, right now I have one option and it's for the lost girls of Paris and it's for a limited run, uh, TV series and who knows if it'll happen, but the writers are amazing. So. Oh, that's so exciting. I and you, have... anything yet? No, no, it but will yeah. Be. Yeah, I'm, I'm dreaming, but I can feel it. I can feel a it. Dream. Yeah. Um, this is an excellent question from Sharon Person. Where do you both want to go when you can travel again? Where's the first place you would travel? And I think let's say internationally, because I mean, obviously, like we want to see family and friends in the U.S. And right. but like, what about you, you? Go, Jane. Where do you want um, to go? Oh, gosh, definitely France. Um, mm -hmm. South of France. I, you know, we taken a couple trips there with the girls and we were gonna maybe do one last summer and it didn't happen and you know obviously um I, I love I'm a total francophile my husband lived there for a while and he speaks beautiful French and um so yeah that, there's a, a little village called Villa Franche Sumer um which it was in the Beantown Girls and I we visited there with my parents on their 40th anniversary 10 years ago and um and we all fell in love with this little village. It's picturesque. It's right on the coast. It's in a lot. You can look up pictures. Um, and then, you know, the, it's it's so weird with coincidences in life. I, we, my husband and I, Charlie and I, bought my parents a picture of Villa Franche Sumer because they loved it so much. It was one of those like little watercolors on the streets that they sell. And then we got back home. 
we found out that my grandfather, who was a firefighter on the Navy ships in World War II, had been stationed off the coast of villafranche sur mer which Oh my goodness, that's a great like, story. So that's amazing. phenomenal. Yeah, so I love that place has a special place in my heart and I, I can't wait to go back there. How about you? That's well, you know, I've lived all over the world and I, I'll get to some more meaningful answers in a second, but the simple truth is I want to go to Disney World oh, yeah, <laughs> with my kids and run around wildly and make up for everything we've missed. But setting that aside, there are three places I would go. I really owe myself that trip to Krakow from last year. I Absolutely. really do. Yeah. Um, I have, I, I went to Cambridge and I have a reunion there next year. And hopefully if there's such a thing, I'd like to go. And then the last thing is the project I'm working on, which I'm not talking about is largely set in Belgium and it's not a place I've spent a lot of time. So I would go to Belgium. Uh, oh, that's a good one too. Yeah. Um, and then uh, there was another good question here. No, I can't, I can't find it. Where do, oh, it was over here. Wait a minute. There's two different things going on in here again. Um, oh, well, what is a pantser? Someone asked, Nancy was a little late to the party. Pantsers are people like Pam who writes by the seat of their pants and writes beautiful books just by sitting down every day and writing. And I just still am like amazed by that. And plotters are people who outline and plot like me who are kind of maniacal. About, about they're not, they're not beautiful. They're not beautiful books, right? They're right. not, oh, yeah. they're not beautiful books when we, uh, when we write the pantsers write them, there are a bunch of rotten words, right? But, uh, <laughs> but yes, it's writing stuff in a random order. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, that's right. And same with the, the outlining. I mean, everything's yeah. a hot mess at the beginning and then you try to yeah. make it better. So oh, Mar Marla says, for goodness sakes, go to Walt Disney World during the food and wine festival. You will love the scrumptious choices at Epcot. That's, <laughs> that's what I need. Fabulous. And your kids are at such a perfect age for Disney yeah. World. And yeah, my, we're, we're crazy for it. We are. Oh, yeah. And my mine are older, but they really want to go back to see the Star Wars stuff. We're total Star Wars nerds. So oh, nice. yeah, yeah, we're yeah. going to do that. Um, so I think we're going to wrap it up, but this was so awesome. I could keep talking to you all night, you know, but <laughs> yeah. thank you for having me. And thank you. I was thank you to me. It's so nice to meet so many new people, but it's also, I'm so grateful to so many friends and longtime readers who I'm seeing in the chat here too many to name because I'll leave someone out, but thank you for being here. Um, and please reach out to me on whatever, wherever you're hanging out online. I would love to keep talking. Yes, you're all over social media, as am I, for better or for worse. And this is coming out May 5th. Sign up for events and pick it for your book club because it's just one of those perfect book club books too. And you have book club um, questions on your website and stuff too. Book club questions. And just as, as of today, I didn't even share this yet online. Um, there's a book club kit, which was just put up. Oh, that's a brilliant idea. I need yes. to get on that. That's such a good idea. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank right. you. Sam. Thank you. So thank you, you for having me. Have a good night. Take care. Bye-bye.